Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of Better Off. And today we're talking about where the economy stands and what it looks like in the future. The biggest risk is China, to be honest with you. The second largest economy in the world. They've got debt up the wazoo. They've got the highest real estate to income prices we've ever seen in the world in a recorded basis. Um, We don't know what a financial crisis in China will look like. We know that it won't look like our financial crisis, but this is the second largest economy in the Mm. world. And unlike Japan, it has tentacles in almost every other economy in the world. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Today, we've got a real treat for you. You know, I love these wonky economists so much, but I especially love the type of wonky economists who can speak in non-wonky ways. That is why we have invited Diane Swank. She is the chief economist at Grant Thornton to join us. Diane has a great way of breaking through the clutter and communicating complicated topics in a way you can understand. She's going to talk about where we are today in the economy and what the future holds. So here's our interview with Diane Swank. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Diane Swank, economist extraordinaire and a female economist, which is a rare it thing. It is unfortunately extremely rare. Terrible. Uh, it's thank horrible. you. It is delightful to meet you. <laughs> Diane, we start this show with a very simple question. What is the best financial or career decision you've ever made? Um, to not take anybody's advice. Really? Well, I was told, you know, um, first of all, I was an only child. We were talking about my dad earlier, and he wanted a son, so he raised me as a son. So I didn't know it until I got older, and he started thinking I should have babies and have grandchildren for him, that um, that was a big issue to him. And But being raised as a son, I didn't realize that I shouldn't do all the things that I was doing, so I didn't take anyone's advice. Um, I was told not to get married, not to have children. Of course, I got married more than once, so that's another issue. Hey, listen. Practice no, makes perfect. No judgments here, as the woman with two divorces behind her is interviewing you. <laughs> uh, we're tied. <laughs> Third time's a charm. Um, and, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I was told to do all these things, and I ignored the advice, and I just kept going. And, you know, I'm kind of like the little ever-ready battery. I just never stop. And, you know, my dad always said never give up as well. And so I guess I took that advice of his, but boy, we locked horns. And all that, all that sort of debate in my childhood prepared me for this world. And also, I started out working for the vice chairman of the bank, which happened to be Bill McDonough when I'm 23 years old, who became the president of the New York Fed. That's amazing. So were you like a math head growing up? <laughs> like, what was it? What was the what brought you to economics and what were the early signs and who helped foster that? That's a great question. Um, so first of all, my dad believed in math, you know, because he was an engineer and he wanted me to be an engineer. And if I'd known the statistics that I know now, mm. um, my specialty is economics of diversity and finding out that it was harder becoming an economist as a woman than it would have been becoming an engineer. I should have probably followed his advice and become an engineer, mm, but well. I didn't, you know. So, first of all, I'm severely dyslexic. Really? Yes. So huh. I flip numbers and I can't dial a phone number straight. And, you know, sequences like these passwords that we have on everything is just absolutely horrible for me. But I could do calculus in my head. By accident in college, I took my first economics class. I walked in, all of the classes were closed. And it was a, you know, a big lecture hall at University of Michigan, you know, 500 kids. They had breakout sessions three days a week. There was only 14 kids in the breakout session. I was the only woman, but I wasn't treated like I was the only woman. And it was this really good looking TA from um, MIT who taught the class. And I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be there. Hmm. And it was just the easiest thing I'd ever done. All of a sudden, it was all my background come together. My mom was an artist. My dad was an engineer. They met at the University of Michigan, had me on their spring break, my mom's spring break, and she went on to get a graduate degree. That's an interesting story in and of itself. So did my father. Um, But they were, you know, in the midst of the civil rights movement. They were activists. Everything that I had learned every day at the kitchen table was what the world meant to my dad's beloved auto industry in Detroit. Hmm. And it was falling apart. So you grew up outside of Detroit? Or yes. Is, right? Okay. Yes. And, and then where did you go to college? At University of Michigan? Two degrees from Michigan, one from University of Chicago, Midwestern through and through, and complete opposites on economic thought. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, I mean, economics, like I said, it was easy, but it was just serendipity because all of a sudden I found a framework to understand the train track I grew up in. My dad was a GM executive. We got a new car every 60 days. My best friend, her father was a union president, and he died when we were 16, and they went into poverty. They had to dig up their backyard. I brought money every day, which we never spoke about, so that she could have lunch. And to understand what happened, it could have been prevented. 
it was like the light turned on. I'm like, this is the easiest thing I've ever done. And it has purpose. And we could change the world. And so it's interesting because I've interviewed a few different economists and the thing that clearly brings them, attracts them to economics versus, say, finance, is this idea around how the policy implications of economics. It's about the world and and human behavior and making the world a better place. And unfortunately, you know, people don't always listen to us. Yes. And, And also, they ask us the wrong questions. It's our job to reframe the questions to answer what we can thoughtfully, rather than, you know, you're a trader. Do you know what the market's going to do tomorrow? No. I don't know what the market's going to do tomorrow. People ask me what the... I don't know what the market's going to do in an hour. Right. Exactly. And especially now with, you know, the high-speed trading that we have, it can... And program trading, which is not necessarily bad, but it can move very, very rapidly. I think back on the financial crisis in particular, because that is seared into my mind, working in finance for 30 years. I've been around a long time, too. You and me both, girl. Yeah, working in finance for a long time. That The financial crisis for me is seared in my mind like a, a slow motion car crash. But so many people have an amnesia to it because they're sideswiped and they're still trying to recover and they don't remember what actually happened because it was so traumatic. When you look back at that financial crisis and leading up to it, the seeds that were being sown it's not just the housing bubble. No. I mean, there are the, the no. an, talk about the antecedent, the the, the thirty years back. Because you come, you talk about the auto industry. I yeah. feel like some of the seeds are sown even back then in the seventies. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look back at the nineteen nineties or the debt decade. The nineteen eighties were the debt decade. I mean, we had debt decade after debt decade. The nineteen nineties and the nineteen eighties were the um, democratization of consumer credit. What we saw was credit cards, and I remember my father used to have the American Express members only yeah. card, and yes. that was like a sign of status, you know, and he was, you know, he said, all these people are pulling out these credit cards. It's crazy what they're doing. You know, he's very conservative on money. But his one, he finally got his, you know, special American Express card. He loved it. It was status. And it went from being a status symbol to being a right. Mm-hmm. And I watched it in the credit card industry and banking for 19 years. I mean, I worked for, with Jamie Dimon for four years as a direct report at Bank One. And we watched the credit card portfolio, and I kept saying, listen, this is adverse selection. We have to be careful here. What you're doing is penalizing people who can switch. It's not a commodity. So explain that for a second, because I don't think that people might have caught that. You're issuing credit cards to basically anyone, and you're saying to the boss or to the risk folks, hey, be careful. Adverse selection means that the only people using this are the people who actually don't have credit anywhere else. Banks were moving into riskier and riskier, offering credit to people who didn't get credit before that once maybe even used to use payday loans. I mean, that's how dramatic the shift was. Mm. And as they did that, um, you know, what happened is people started arbitraging. They started looking for a cheap credit card and, and they would flip and they would move their balances over and they would look for better interest rates. What you happened is the more you penalize people, the more you pushed out the best credit borrowers, and so your margins were going down, it was still profitable. Credit card was still more profitable than anything else in banking. Mm-hmm. And that was, changed like in the 70s because there was a change in the banking yes, laws, right? Yes, right. Yes. So, okay. And so it built, up, it built up, and they kept issuing credit to less and less credit-worthy people. Mm-hmm. And the people who were opting in were, that's the adverse selection, were the people we wanted least. And I kept trying to say, this is you have to think about that. Right. And sure enough, it snuck up. But I remember I left banking, and I went into another finance company, Mesro Financial, for 10 years after that in 2004, and my dog... Buddy got a pre approved credit card in the mail. Oh my God. Buddy <laughs> Swan. I have gotten out just in time. <laughs> Buddy Swan, yes. uh, you have been approved for yes, a $2,000 right. line. Yes. That's awesome. And I, oh my gosh. I was just glad my kids were so young that, you know, my, it wasn't when my daughter was a teenager or something. But, and she inter- got it. but interestingly enough, you know, we talk about, you know, coming out of the auto industry. I also think that the the strange thing that starts to happen is that after the 70s, where we do start to see a change in the economy, and, and it's probably the, the last time we saw the strength of labor unions and wages, that all these people who were basically middle class people who were maybe seeing a little slipping, they were just, oh, it's, it's not quite oh, yeah. as easy as it was. And to make up that difference, they weren't getting raises. They went into debt. They went into and debt. So, and we went into debt collectively, not just as individuals, as a nation. The 80s was a debt decade when... You know, Ronald Reagan ran on a a ticket that said, you know, if we could stack dollar bills from here to the moon, it still wouldn't be our debt. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't account for all of our debt. And the idea was we had too much debt. And then we blew it up even more in the 1980s because we had tax cuts and big increases in spending. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. 
We'll get back to our interview with Diane Swank in just a minute. But boy, I loved her uh, first part of the program where we asked her her best financial decision. And she it was do not take anyone's advice. And I think that that's what many average investors do. They take the advice of a salesperson. They take the advice of their cousin. Well, you know what? You are not the average investor. So why are you settling for the same old average investing or investment advice? Now there's a smarter way to manage your money, Betterment. Betterment is an online financial advisor for people who refuse to settle for average. Betterment uses cutting-edge technology to build personalized portfolios and help you make more from your investments. Don't settle for average investing. Demand better. Of course, investing does involve risk. You know that. But our Better Off listeners, you can get up to one year managed free by visiting Betterment.com slash Better Off. That's Betterment.com slash Better Off. And now back to our interview with Diane Swank. I posted something last week and I asked, you know, when will the sugar high of tax cuts yeah. wear off? So I will ask you, because you're an economist and I just talk about this crap. When will the sugar high? Well, you know, there's a couple things that are coming to a head that aren't really good. And this is why for the first time in my life, I've actually forecast a recession. First time in my life. That's fascinating. That's really so interesting. So tell in us why. Um, so in the fourth quarter of 2019, if we have a split government, that maybe can't agree. Yeah. On a budget, mm. which seems highly probable. They can't agree much with them, with each other inside these parties, let alone across party lines. So mm-hmm. I have my doubts about what the 2020 budget will look like. Mm-hmm. Um, even though it's an election year, we've done it before, where we've held back. And so we're set up now, now that we prime the spigot mm. and add a lot of spending, in the fourth quarter of 2019, that's the beginning of what they call the fiscal year for the government. We could actually fall off a fiscal cliff if we mm. don't allocate all of that additional spending and more so, which will only add to our debts and deficits, but that's something to think about. So that's one thing out there. Mm-hmm. The effects of the tax cut starting in January, year over year on profits and how they compare them, it dissipates, it goes away on a year over year basis because they got this big boost in January in the first quarter of 2018 from the 2016, 17 ca- mm-hmm. tax cuts. In 2019, you just, on a year over year basis, you can't compare as well, so you're kind of climbing an uphill battle there. Mm-hmm. You add the corrosive effects uh, on margins, um, squeezing profit margins and putting it into consumer prices eventually of tariffs, which I think will go up dramatically in December. We could see 25% tariffs on $517 billion of goods from China, and that would mean we have almost 20% of imports now taxed, and they're taxing, essentially, at the end of the day, the U.S. consumer. Mm-hmm. Right now, we're taxing the supply chain in the U.S. It will make it through its way. Because right the now, consumer. the wholesalers are eating it, right? They're eating it. Okay. And, but they've, they've also changed, I talked to a lot of our clients, they've mm-hmm. changed their um, way of doing contracts. And so contracts that were once long-term that forced them to eat it, now they're have variable contracts. They only go mm. for a month or two months, and mm. they reprice on whatever comes on their input costs. It's like a snowball at the top of a mountain. It's really small and insignificant at the top, but by the time it hits the bottom, it's a boulder that crushes anything in its path. I don't like the word crush. It's like, sort of like I crash. Know. It's not good. I know. Not a good thing. I know. So we just had our first reading of third quarter growth, which was a 3.5% three three and annual yes. print. Um, let's say that holds ish around there. What does the fourth quarter look like to you? We're looking at about 2.7, 2.6. Okay. And we're already set up for it because part of what happened in the third quarter was inventories got built because all these companies were scrambling to buy ahead of tariffs. Right, because that was also part of Q2, yes. which was a huge pop, 4.2. Yes. yes, and we had another round of tariffs, and we keep adding more. And so they scrambled to buy ahead. They don't have much capacity to hold it anymore because mm. we have just in time inventories. They don't have a lot. They're competing with you know the, the Amazons of the world for warehousing space mm. as well. So there's not a lot of places to store this stuff. They bought ahead to the extent they could. And that means, you know, now that the tariffs are coming through, they they are going to drain them. So oh, that's that's, that's a, interesting. It's a headwind going forward. OK, so when we get the December Fed meeting, we're going to get another quarter percent. It's a foregone conclusion. OK, now let's go into 2019. What do you think is going to happen if I start if I turn the page? It's uh, we do big picture. We say tariffs. We see the wearing off of, of, of tax of cut. tax tax cut diminishing, diminishing. In, in impact. But we've still got the spigot and fiscal stimulus through the third quarter. So you got government spending as a kick. Okay. Consumers, we got more paychecks. Um, we do have some acceleration in wages as well, which is wonderful. It's not as much as I'd want, mm-hmm. but we'll take what we can get because that's moving in the right direction. And more paychecks. Okay. So if that's the case, then what does Q1 2019 look like 
guesstimate. I won't hold you to this. There's just, there's just hundreds of thousands of people listening to you right now. I actually have a lower forecast for 2019 than many people, but it's still enough to erode, to continue to push down the unemployment rate. Okay, so 2019 Q1, what do you 2%. think? 2%. Okay. If that's a 2% print and the Fed's looking at all the same data you look at, then will they not raise? No, they'll continue raising because that's mm. 2% off a of 3 point probably 6% unemployment rate mm. and accelerating wages and inflation you get a pop in inflation in the first quarter if we do get those tariffs through because you can't absorb them in the margins and you don't have the cushion of those tax cuts as a company to absorb them anymore so now i get a march rate hike yes okay i get a quarter of a point yeah i th- i have four rate hikes they might also move four next year that's what so then is the fed going to cause the next recession are they going to not want be- it they probably will i mean i think it's wrong to criticize the fed but no i agree jay, jay powell he has decided very um i think astutely that the fed is pretty humble by the fact they couldn't forecast the economy very well they didn't forecast the crash they were chasing down growth they kept thinking growth was going to come back faster and it didn't and now all of a sudden they're chasing growth up the idea that the Fed once had, and you and I go back far enough to remember these days when Greenspan thought he could preemptively do what he needed to do to the economy and fine tune it. And that's just gone out the window. Yeah. That view is no longer out there. If you're only reacting to the data, if you can't anticipate weakness, by definition, once we really see the corrosive effects of tariffs, which really don't start to show up until the latter part, it takes a long time, latter part of 2019 and early 2020, you're going to, by definition, be behind the curve and overshoot mm. on tightening, on raising rates. Mm. And that's something that I think you have to understand that, you know, the this sort of inside baseball of the Fed itself and how it thinks about how it's been humbled and how the the legacy of the crisis has left a way of doing policy that actually gets us back to where we were of a Fed actually being one of the factors, one of many factors that throws us into a recession. If As you look at a recession, I mean, obviously, we're not going to have, we may not have, I shouldn't say not, but it's unlikely we're going to have the same kind of recession we no, had 10 we years should, ago. we shouldn't have, I mean, it no, should be we'll like have a, a different run-of-the-mill g- recession, hopefully. Hopefully, although we have fewer tools to combat it once I know. we get in it. And the impact of raising rates and also unloading some of these bonds from QE. Yeah, allowing them to mature off. They're not right? selling them. They're not selling them. But they are re- Reducing their bloated $4 trillion balance sheet. Okay. So what is the big risk that you see in the next recession? Is it corporate debt? Is that is that corporate a spider debt swing problem? Well, the biggest risk is China, to be honest with you. The second largest economy in the world. They've got debt up the wazoo. They've got the highest real estate to income prices we've ever seen in the world in a recorded basis. And um, we don't know what a financial crisis in China will look like. We know that it won't look like our financial crisis, but this is the second largest economy mm. in the world. And unlike Japan, it has tentacles in almost every other economy in the world. Mm. So this is where you get into the corrosive effect and the stuff you can't model, uncertainty, the spillover effects. How does it affect confidence in the global economy? China was the largest contributor to growth on the margin of the global economy from 2003 to 2013. What if it goes in the other direction? Right. Even if it doesn't contract, a slowdown in China is a dramatic change from what we've seen. So uh, we could go from 6.5% growth, which is probably a phony number anyway that they say, number. right? Their but, lowest number they printed, but yes, it's a phony okay, number. Okay, but let's say... But, but say it goes to, say, 4 they're that's a huge to, change. That's a huge, huge change. And, you know, they can't even service their own debt if they slip down to 3 to 4%. Oh, my God. All right. Um, Mark says you have to go because we want to make sure you catch your plane. <laughs> uh, before you go, let's leave on a nice note. Because, a good note. I know. I know. Uh, I'm like, I, I, I'm a Debbie. De- I'm like, you know what? I got to tell you this. So, you know, being an economist, this isn't my first rodeo. Right. right? Dismal around- scientist you are. Well, no. I, you know, I've been euphoric before. And you I have? realize when you're standing in the sun is when you need to look in the shadows. And if you really want to help people to manage the economy, you need to say this is when it's cheap to hedge. This is when you should be cautious not complacent and look turn over the stones in your garden see how that soil is doing underneath what could come up and choke your garden Mm -hmm. so when i'm standing in the sun i look in the shadows and you know it's just do i know exactly where it's going to come from no but i i think it's important to look there are times where I think that my pessimism has served me quite well. And so I agree. So everyone listening here, it doesn't mean we are going to have a recession on the date that Diane no, says, but no, it does mean that 2020, we could avoid it if we change policies. Yeah. This is preventable. And it's not just on the Fed. This is on all of a sudden it really matters what they do in Washington because they're doing something in Washington. And we have to ma- think about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't want so much debt that interest rates do actually rise. 
And there's a lot of reasons why historically people said, well, you know, higher debt loads of the U.S. government has not meant higher rates. Well, a lot of other stuff was going on. Yes, we are having massive technological and productivity gains. Unbelievable stuff was going on. Right. We are moving into a world where, you know, I went to school in a time when there were double-digit interest rates, right. early 1980s. You yeah. know, I saw 25% unemployment rates in my own backyard in Flint, Michigan. Um, I think it's important to be optimistic about the world and not be pessimistic. And I, what is my biggest optimism? And I want to leave you on one optimistic note. Okay. Millennials. Yeah. They're aligned. They're the totally most, agree with you. The, the most diverse, the most educated. Women are out attaining men in educational attainment. They're um, 30% called new minorities. That's Hispanic, Asian, and more than two races. And millennials are something we've got and other economies don't. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, before we go, your best financial decision was ignoring everyone's advice. Yes. Or <laughs> career. My best, my best career decision career. Was and, what, and what's your worst? My worst. Um, you know, I regret now not being more active politically. Wow. I've been, I put economics ahead of politics. And most people don't know my personal politics. Um, my dad was really, and my parents, my mom, was were really active politically. And they went, they moved. I mean, my dad was conservative, then he was liberal, and then he was conservative, and then he kind of evened out over time and just grew. But I see the world today and I worry about what it means for my daughter and my son. Diane Swank, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, Jill. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Okay, it's time to focus on you. After our interview segment, we do talk to you and we have our listener question of the week. Don't forget, you've got two chances every week to get on the air. Just let us know what's going on. Send us an email, ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. Today, we're talking to Bruce in Illinois. Hey, Bruce, what can I do for you? Hi, Joe. What an honor to speak to you. Oh, thank hey. you very much. <laughs> hey, um, so my question is, you know, if money buys you freedom and money buys you options, what what point, where's the, where's the tipping point? You know, where, when can you kind of just walk away from what you have to do and you can start doing what you want to do? Well, I think that that point comes after you've actually run through your retirement planning scenario. So what you've probably heard me do on the show when I talk about that, you know, money buys you options and and give you that whole song and dance, what you likely hear me do is say to somebody, start with, hey, tell me about yourself. Tell me how much money you've saved. Tell me what kind of income you're going to have in retirement. Tell me what you need in terms of your retirement income goals going forward. And so we work backwards. We do that and then we work backwards and we say, okay, let's see where you are. So let's do that for you. How about that? Tell me how oh, old so, you are. Uh, I'm 52. My wife's 53. Okay. And tell me about what's going on and see if we can find you some financial freedom. Well, <laughs> okay. So between like Roths and 401ks and those type of things, we're like at 1.3 and a half maybe. And... I've got two pensions lined up. My wife's got one pension lined up when we finally pull the plug. I can, I can, I would like to semi retire and go into something different as soon as possible because okay. I really am not happy where I'm working. Okay. The commute's killing me, that kind of thing. You know, mm. it's, it's just creating uh, undue stress in our relationship. Yeah. And so, and, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm really at that tipping point where I, I really want to walk away from what I'm doing, continue working in the industry that I'm in, but not who I'm working for. Got it. Um, So you've got a bunch of money saved already, um, and you say you're going to have pensions. So tell me about, first, let's let's do the pensions. How much will you receive and at what age? Okay, so I have a military pension sitting out there that I can start receiving at age 60. Mm -hmm. That's going to be about $1,000 to $1,100 a month. Okay. And then I have another pension um, that I'll start receiving. I can start receiving as early as 55. And if I, if I walk away now from it, that's what I'm working at now, I'd only get about 1000 If I walk away at 55, I'd get about 1200 If I work till 58, I'd get about 1800 But if again, between the two pensions, if you just wanted them right this second and you said, I'm a done, you'd have two grand a month coming in between the two, correct? Roughly, yeah. And my wife would have, when she finally retires, she'll have about 1200 a month. Okay. So how much do you guys need to live on? Not a lot. We have no no debt whatsoever. Zero. Mm, I love that. 
So, um, but what do you? But what do you? But you, know, you obviously have to live. What do you? What do you want we, to live well, on? Well, we what we what we make is about a hundred between the two of us. Uh huh. And we probably put away. We try to put away the max that we can of that. You know, uh, probably we probably try to put away about thirty-five to forty percent of that. If wow. after taxes, mm-hmm. that's pretty darn good. So, well, you you, what do you figure? You think you need like four grand a month just for like for real, just to live your life um, and have fun? Five? <laughs> well, we do, you know the one lecture we do have is we like to travel a couple times a year. All right. So we we figure we figured um, you know maybe. I mean, you don't have a house payment. It makes everything so different. Sure. Um, and so, I mean, we can, 2000 a month, we can get by on. But my wife's not looking to retire. She's right. not looking to vacate the, you know, change change course. Well, I mean, it sounds like you're in great shape then. I mean, you're going to have this money. You don't have a big lifestyle. You would, you want to leave your current job, but you would be willing to work. Right. So right. what what's the downside here? Except that obviously, you know, like a pension's a guarantee and you would be, earn more money, but... What are you worried about? I mean, I think you probably know these numbers. You're looking at these numbers. You've got pensions. You you would be willing to work. What is it that is holding you back from making a different choice going forward? That's a great question because it's because of the industry that I'm in. I, I can change industries, but the one that I'm in, I've been in for the last 15 years roughly, mm-hmm. is I really have to be near a corporate headquarters or agency level headquarters. And where I live currently, there really isn't any. Um, I I commute, you know, roughly two and a half hours a day oh. to go to my work. Like, so if I changed where I work, I'd have to actually actually relocate probably. And the problem is my you know my my wife's parents are getting older. They're in their you know nineties, and we live near them, so she can keep an eye on them and help them and take care of them. Mm. And so for me to stay in my industry, either my commute would be much, you know, worse, or we'd have to relocate and she could only see her, she could only see her parents, you know, not as much as she does now. So that means that you really don't have a choice. What you're saying what, to me, what you're, what I'm hearing from you is you, if you were going to call it quits from your current job, you would never be able to stay in your current career and make as much money. Could you do something else I mean, I hate to say this because it sounds terrible, but like, could you do something else until they pass away? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I'm a, I'm a jack of all trades, a master of none. So, I mean, I've, I've had, you know, four or five career shifts, so it's not a big deal for me. It's mm-hmm. just that, you know, that stepping away at, from, from, a, from a, a, a job that has good benefits, just a real toxic environment, you know. Yeah, but I'm like, but I, I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that you're like, oh, you're like bummed out about this, and it's in a bad, you're in a bad place. Um, and your wife has a job. How how does she feel about her job? I mean, can you get benefits from her? Yes, I, yeah, I can get benefits from her. Obviously, you know, it costs twice as much than what we're paying now. But yeah, um, but so I mean, yeah, but I mean, like I, you said, you have very low expenses. I mean, it, it stinks. I don't want you to have to pay. I I guess that all right. So here's the the bottom line. I think is that it really, this does not sound like a financial decision in a lot of ways. It sounds like a life decision that's freaking you out. And I get that it's freaking you out because life decisions are so scary. Uh, And so I think at some point you have to decide how much you feel comfortable enduring, whether it's the commute or the job you really don't like, I'll just say this on your behalf because Bruce in his email to us wrote that he had a soul sucking job, which <laughs> makes me. And you know what? I get that. We've all had those moments in our lives where we know it's just not right. And by the way, Mark and I were just talking about this because we were talking about uh, a former boss or colleague that he had who he basically said to me, that is essentially why I left because of that person, because that person although he was happy in the job he was doing, but that person made his life so unbearable and that he literally would have like stomach aches going into work because he could not stand the environment. And that pushed him to make a different decision. Now, okay, he was a lot younger. He wasn't married. He had no kids. It was a lot easier to make that choice at that point in his life. But in your case, I guess I'm wondering just, you know, what it's going to take to make you move forward. I think that you probably have 
plenty of money to do what you are doing. If you really feel trapped, are you creating that trap for yourself? I don't think that it's the financial thing. I think you're creating that. So can you give yourself permission? Could you even take like a sabbatical and see how, you know, maybe you can say, gosh, I really need to take a sabbatical and see what six months looks like. How do you feel about that? Um, I love the idea. I just got to tell my wife on it. <laughs> Why? She's like, keep working, dummy? Uh, well, you know, it's you know, it's a relationship, and whatever I do affects her and vice versa. You know, okay, so. so now I'm going to give you other advice that has nothing to do with financial stuff. I think your financial stuff is fine. You've done a great okay. job of – you've done a really good job of saving, okay? Obviously, every day, every week, every month that you remain in your soul-sucking job, it actually inures to your benefit, because your pension will keep getting bigger. So that's number one. I think there's two choices for you guys. One is that you actually go to a financial planner, sit down with your wife, pay, you know, a thousand bucks to have somebody, you know, spend a few hours with you, build out this retirement plan and prove to your wife that you guys would be fine financially. That's one thing. And the other thing is, that person may be able to show her because again it's a it's an unbiased third party that to me is what you need to do you can't be convincing her she doesn't want to hear it from you obviously so you're going to have to seek the assistance of someone else to bring her along and if that doesn't work you know what maybe you go to a shrink but i actually think the financial <laughs> advisor is going to be better mark don't you think so that like a a, re- a good cfp who's skilled with the sort of like helping them through this could could get them to a different place. It's really that that's what you I think you need. Okay. All right, great. All right. So either that or you're gonna you'll play Mark is gonna send this call to you so you have it and you can play it to her. I think you guys have done a terrific job of saving. That is really your I mean, you have purchased your lottery ticket, meaning that you've you've basically saved a ton of money. You've worked really hard and you now have opportunities to make different choices. And my hope for you and your wife is that you see these choices and that you take advantage of them. Because why do it? Why work so hard and be in this soul-sucking job if you weren't able to make this choice? Let's just get your wife on board. I don't know. I feel like she's going to do it. I think she is. I have faith in her. And I have faith in you. So, Bruce, thank you so much for calling. And I really wish you the very best of luck. Thanks to our guest, Diane Swank, and our caller, Bruce. Don't forget, we drop new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email, askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13, and we're sponsored by Betterman. See you next week.